Some American versions say that Japanese guns fired on Japanese ships near the end of this battle. After checking with all my friends who took part in the battle, and after examining damage to the surviving Japanese destroyers, I can definitely state that this contention is unfounded. On the other hand, many of my friends say that the American ships exchanged gunfire among themselves in this battle. After Amatsukaze's helm and rudder were disengaged from the shattered hydraulic system, we resumed navigation. Luckily, the engines were in good order, and we quickly picked up a 20-knot speed. It is always difficult to handle the rudder of a 2,500-ton ship manually, and Amatsukaze had been badly battered. Her gears were twisted, and there were many gaping holes in the hull. The ship moved like a drunken man, skidding wildly from side to side. After a few painful minutes of watching this erratic movement, I knew what had to be done, and spoke into the tube. Matsumoto, I'll take over. This manpower operation requires experience. Your timing is off. From now on, I'll give steering orders from up here and you pass them to your boys. Ten husky men dripped sweat handling the rudder. It was a back-breaking task. But my chore wasn't easy. I had to keep shouting almost steadily. My voice croaked and sweat streamed down my face. The veering movement continued, but the steering was less erratic. At three, Miyoshi reported that all fires were under control. A few minutes later, I saw Hiei to port. Her fires appeared to have subsided, but the flagship was almost at a standstill. There were no Japanese ships around to offer help. I felt sorry for my friends in the doomed ship, but my ship was in no shape to help anyone. The most I could do was to keep her going in a northerly direction. It was barely possible for us to negotiate the narrow waters of indispensable strait. Mustering all my strength and determination, I kept shouting directions into the voice tube, and we kept moving. At the first sign of daylight, Ensign Shoji shouted, Three enemy planes approach. I ordered, Miyoshi, take command of the guns. Do your best. The torpedo officer darted from the bridge. An orderly reported shortly, No guns rotate, and only no. One gun can be elevated skyward. That lone gun fired rapidly as the planes came close. They overestimated our speed and released their bombs too early. The nearest one fell some 300 metres off our bows. After one pass, the planes turned back toward Guadalcanal. More planes would probably follow, but brooding was of no use. We had work to do just keeping the ship moving forward, and we kept at it. Our luck seemed about to run out when Shoji next reported, Commander, a ship sighted 9,000 metres ahead, speeding straight for us. What should we do, sir? Instead of replying, I yelled into the pipe again, Matsumoto, an undetermined ship is sighted ahead. Make your maximum speed. We can do nothing but ram if it is the enemy. Shoji dashed out to prepare the crew for this drastic action. I glanced again at the ship. It was closing on us at a speed of well over 30 knots. After a tense minute, I breathed a deep sigh of relief and called my orderly to summon Shoji quickly. It's a Japanese destroyer, yes, Yukikaze, unmistakably. Shoji came back leaping and bouncing with joy and relief. From a distance of 3,000 metres, a Yukikaze signalman started waving flags. They were distinct in the morning light. Heartiest congratulations to Amatsukaze. We're heading to assist Hiei. Anything we can do for you? My signalman immediately relayed my answer. Thanks for your greetings. Don't bother about us. Go ahead full speed. Enemy planes already spotted us. Very probably Hiei too. Be prepared for air attack. Good luck. We passed Yukikaze on our port beam at a distance of 1,000 metres. Crews on deck exchanged greetings. Though they had travelled a long way together in the meantime, this was the first time the two ships had seen each other since early the previous day. Yukikaze had been stationed immediately ahead of Amatsukaze in Abe's complex formation. We had not been visible to each other for the many hours of our blind march. In the battle, Yukikaze and cruiser Nagara were among the first to withdraw from the area. Yukikaze had not received a single hit. My warning to Yukikaze proved right. Scores of marine bombers swarmed over Hiei and demolished her. Admiral Abe ordered Hiei scuttled before abandoning ship as Yukikaze came alongside. It was this scuttling order which cost the jobs of Abe and Captain Masao Nishida, Hiei's skipper, a few days later. After passing Yukikaze, my ship slowed to its previous twenty knots. We were out of the hazardous strait and in a wide area. Our worries about shoals and reefs were over, but new worries cropped up. 
daylight was unwelcome to a lone, crippled ship in an area infested by enemy submarines. The sonar equipment in Japanese destroyers, as explained earlier, was not of a high standard. Even when in working order, it was useless when a ship was running at 20 knots or better. Amatsukaze's sonar was completely dead at this time. Matsumoto, you had better change your rudder detail every hour. We'll need real muscular strength to make any abrupt turns. Submarines may set on us at any moment. Strangely enough, for the next 12 hours there were no attacks. Enemy submarines must have seen Amatsukaze. Perhaps there was no attack because they did not realize that the lone wolf was limping. Amatsukaze was running at a steady 20 knots. Its skidding to left and right must have seemed like an intentional zigzag pattern. Had they come close, they would have seen how beaten up and crippled we were. About 15 another Japanese destroyer loomed on the horizon. Knowing we had reached safety, I suddenly felt exhausted. Accurate navigation had brought us to a spot about 250 miles north of Guadalcanal, where Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita's fleet was standing by to sortie that night. As we closed in, I found destroyer Terutsuki, another companion of the Abe fleet. My signalman sent a message inquiring as to the general situation. A reply came quickly. Welcome home, Amatsukaze. Our heartiest congratulations. You were reported lost hours ago. Few of us expected your return. Our fleet did well. Only Hiei and Yudachi were reported dead in the water. Akatsuki has not been heard from and is considered lost. Murasame and Ikazuchi received shell hits, none vital. Again, congratulations. You worked a wonder. We are proud of you. As we approached Terutsuki, again most all of her crew moved to the railings and waved at us, calling, Ataboy Amatsukaze. Several other ships repeated the same kind of welcome for us, but I felt no triumph at all. My heart was heavy with remorse at my blunders. Amatsukaze was already inside the formation of Kurita's ships and was slowing down. His flagship, 27,500-ton battleship Congo, emerged like a fortress. Her signalman was sending a flag message to us. From Admiral Kurita to Commander Hara, I salute your brave return and am pleased to inform you I have orders for you to go along in my sortie. I shall be proud to have you with us. Acknowledge. I was astounded at this message and replied promptly, From Commander Hara to Admiral Kurita, your compliments unwarranted. I return a cripple with loss of 43 crewmen, including gunnery officer. We are in need of repair. We are on manual steering now. A few minutes later, Congo's message came. Admiral Kurita orders you to return to Truk immediately. We repeat our respects to you all the same. Bon voyage and good luck. See you again. Congo blurred through my tears as I read this warm message. I was choked up but managed to rasp into the voice tube. Matsumoto, turn to starboard. We are going home. Yes, sir, Matsumoto replied. Say, Commander, you sound tired. Why don't you rest? You have been shouting continuously for the past 15 hours. I have learned enough of the rhythm and timing from your rudder directions to handle it now. Thank you, Matsumoto. I guess you are right. You take over. I sat down for the first time in more than 24 hours. Minutes later, I sprang from the chair. I had forgotten something. Miyoshi, Shoji, we must conduct funeral services before dark. Forty-three bodies, some mere token remains, were brought to the foredeck. Close friends of each of the deceased came forward, cleansed the bodies with hot fresh water and wrapped them in canvas. Precious distilled water was used freely for this ceremony. The wrapped and weighted bodies were dropped into the sea while buglers sounded a farewell, and the crew saluted. A sea burial is always sad. I had attended several such services, but never one so sad as this. When Miyoshi and Shoji consigned the first remains, a leg of Lieutenant Kazue Shimizu, the gunnery officer, to the sea, I wept. Shimizu, a headstrong man, had often argued with me, but he was a fine man and an excellent officer. If I had followed his recommendation and closed with Juno, perhaps I would not have committed the blunders which cost his life. Two petty officers stepped forward to take care of the body of Warrant Officer Iwata, the man who, by sighting Helena, had once saved the ship and crew. I walked down from the bridge. The crew stared. It was the first time I had left the bridge since the start of this operation. Iwata was my friend. I will take care of his remains. The two men gaped when I doffed my uniform jacket and put it over Iwata. 
Iwata, farewell, I murmured. Rest in peace. Tears flooded my eyes as I stood at attention and saluted. Trudging back to the bridge, I saw many crewmen weeping like children, several wiping their eyes with their fists. As I watched the setting of the big fiery sun, I pledged never to repeat my mistakes. It was completely dark by the time the funeral services ended. Amatsukaze circled the burial area once while the crew offered prayers in a final farewell to their 43 buddies and then continued to the north. Matsumoto, a young graduate of the Merchant Marine School, had learned the manual handling of the rudder very quickly. The ship advanced with a minimum of skidding, and 24 hours later, on November 14, Amatsukaze anchored in Truk's quiet atoll. At Truk, I heard that Japanese submarine I-26 had just torpedoed and sunk a crippled United States cruiser near Guadalcanal. It was years later, however, that I learned that this was cruiser Juno which Amatsukaze had hit and disabled. The battle ended unquestionably in a Japanese victory, but the win was purely tactical. Strategically, the enemy had won because the Abe force failed to deliver a single incendiary shell to Guadalcanal airfields. Nine American warships were sunk, but not in vain. They contributed greatly to the American side in the bitter contest for this island. Admiral Yamamoto at Truk was upset by the failure of Abe's mission. Hiei was the first Japanese battleship to be sunk in the war. Its scuttling infuriated Yamamoto, who had been quite lenient with earlier blunders committed by others of his men. The high command in Tokyo was also stung. The anger of the top admirals did not abate when they heard of Vice Admiral Nobutok Kondo's failure, immediately following that of Abe. A panel of admirals was established to conduct a secret court of inquiry. Abe and Captain Nishida, Hiei's skipper, were called to testify. They offered no defence of their actions or mistakes. The court's verdict was retirement for the two officers, almost the equivalent of the US Navy's dishonourable discharge. They were allowed pensions, but were barred from public office. On the night of November 13, Rear Admiral Shoji Nishimura's squadron of three cruisers and four destroyers closed the coast of Guadalcanal and shelled the airfields. The shelling was so ineffective that marine planes rose from these airfields next morning. They teamed with carrier Enterprise planes and swooped on a Japanese convoy of 11 transports, sinking or disabling seven of them. The planes also sank cruiser Kinugasa and heavily damaged three destroyers. Admiral Kondo, deputy commander-in-chief of the combined fleet, was ordered to replace Kurita as leader of the next sortie on the night of November 14. Two 13,000-ton cruisers, Atago and Takao, under Kondo's direct command, were suddenly teamed with the original Abe fleet, Les Hiei and three destroyers. Admiral Yamamoto's choice of Kondo proved to be a disastrous mistake. It is still a mystery to me why Yamamoto thought so highly of Kondo, even after his half-hearted actions in two earlier important battles. Kondo's three battleships, small cruiser and nine destroyers, encountered a clearly inferior American force of two battleships and four destroyers led by Rear Admiral Willis Augustus Lee. Despite his distinct numerical advantage, Kondo lost battleship Kirishima and a destroyer, while Lee lost only three destroyers. Kondo's two fast cruisers were still intact, but Kondo ordered their withdrawal without even trying to give chase to the American ships. It was his third such half-hearted effort in four months. Admiral Yamamoto, who was stern with Abe, was strangely lenient with Kondo. Many of Kondo's officers were ashamed of him and of themselves. They preferred not to talk about the battle. Kondo was the British gentleman sort of man. He was amiable and affable to everyone and was known as a scholar. He was always good to me, and I had great respect for him. But I must say that it was one of Yamamoto's greatest errors that he so greatly overvalued Kondo's fighting ability. Kondo might have been a great commandant of the Naval Academy, but he was a misfit as commander of a naval fighting unit. At Truk Amatsukaze went alongside repair ship Akashi, whose chief engineer promptly came on board to inspect our damage. I acknowledged that our ship had been banged up a bit, but pointed out that she had made it back to port under her own steam, and concluded with my hope that Amatsukaze could be patched up without delay, so that we might join the fleet again in a week or ten days. The engineer smiled patiently and said, Commander Hara, most skippers underestimate damage in their own ship, and when engaged in battle, do things considered impossible in a normal voyage. Let's look around. 
I understand you fitted out this ship. Will you come along and explain her finer points? Amatsukaze was indeed my baby. As her fitting out officer, I had been at her launching early in 1940 and had spent the next six months supervising her every need. She was the finest destroyer of her day, this 2,500-ton fighting ship, and I knew every inch of her. The engineer and I spent a day going over her injuries. By the end of the tour, my optimism had fallen flat on its face. In her hull, we counted 32 holes larger than one metre in diameter. In addition, there were five smaller holes which had been bored by dud shells. After 40 small shrapnel holes, I stopped counting. That American cruiser had done a real job, which I had estimated as only three hits. The engineer was right. No longer a prize destroyer, Amatsukaze was but a floating wreck. At the end of the tour, we came to my cabin where I flopped into a chair, depressed and morose. The engineer said understandingly, Let me congratulate you on magnificent seamanship in bringing your ship back at all, let alone in such good time. You have really worked a miracle, but it cannot be repeated. I recognised the truth of his words, but was so dispirited that I had nothing to say. He continued, As you must realise, we cannot concentrate all our efforts on your Amatsukazi. There are others that need repairs too. I estimate that it will take a month to patch up your ship enough to get back to Japan. Their precision parts will be available, and it should be possible to have a Matsukaze fully seaworthy in one month. But, I stammered, there is evidence that the enemy can effect major repairs in much less than 60 days. Why can't we? I knew that the answer lay in the enemy's tremendous industrial capacity, so far superior to Japan's, and realised how embarrassing my question was. An awkward silence followed until I spoke again. Please do your best. I will stay with my ship. My men will cooperate with your repair crews in every possible way. The engineer expressed his appreciation, saluted and withdrew. I was left to brood and again strolled the decks of my ship. Countless holes from machine gun bullets made me feel that we were lucky not to have lost more than 43 lives. Repairs were begun the following morning. For the next week I was busy showing off my miracle ship to visitors from battleship Yamato and other ships anchored in the harbour of Truk. Without exception they marvelled that Amatsukaze had survived. Many visitors congratulated me but none asked my opinion of how to avoid such a fate in the future. I was more than ready with many recommendations but no one asked. It puzzled me that not one of the staff officers from Combined Fleet who visited my battle-scarred ship was interested enough to ask me for opinions or recommendations. When this lack of curiosity continued throughout the week, I began to wonder about the ability of these men. It was disquieting to think that they, who were helping to form plans and strategy, were not interested in learning from recent battle experiences. Perhaps they were not as well qualified for their jobs as they should be, a most disturbing thought indeed. Two letters from Japan reached me at Truk. In a letter written on November 13, my wife told of conditions at home and concluded, Little Mikito awakened suddenly last night and cried loud and long. I thought at first he was sick, but he finally explained that he had dreamed you were in danger. He said you looked pale and frightened. I wonder where you were last night and what you were doing. The newspapers tell of bitter battles in the South. I am worried about you. Noting the date, I recalled the night of November 12 to 13 and its dangers. I must have looked pale when we were being battered by the enemy cruiser, because I certainly was frightened. How could my little son have seen it? My mother, 82 years of age, had written the other letter. It concluded, I pray each morning and night at the family altar that our ancestors and the merciful Buddha will protect you, take care of yourself and come back alive. My eyes filled with tears at reading this. My thoughts turned to the families of my dead crewmen, and I wept aloud. Letters of condolence must be written to those 43 families before I could reply to my wife and mother. The sun was setting when I finished this sad task eight hours later and walked out on deck. A motorboat approached Amatsukaze, another curious spectator, but the courtesies must be observed. I approached the ramp as the boat came alongside. The passenger shouted a cheery greeting as he came up, and I recognised Commander Yasumi Toyama, he was Chief of Staff on Rear Admiral Razio Tanaka's Destroyer Squadron 2, based at Rabaul. I had previously belonged to this squadron, and we were old friends. 
He was in Truk for tactical conferences in Admiral Yamamoto's flagship Yamato. You look sick, he said. What is the matter? Were you hurt in battle? No, not a bit. I just feel let down. Anyone would after his ship had taken a beating like this. No, Hara, you should not feel bad. You did a terrific job. I had a good look at Amatsukaze from the motorboat. I knew you were the Navy's number one torpedo officer, but never realized what a navigator you are. Any other skipper would have lost this ship. I can't agree, Toyama. We were just lucky that those countless enemy shells missed the engine and fuel tanks. Tell me, how is the squadron? Ah, he groaned. We are more a freighter convoy than a fighting squadron these days. The damn Yankees have dubbed us the Tokyo Express. We transport cargo to that cursed island, and our orders are to flee rather than fight. What a stupid thing. It is doubtful whether we could fight anyway. Our decks are stacked so high with supplies for Guadalcanal that our ammunition supply must be cut in half. Our cargo is loaded in drums which are roped together. We approach near the island, throw them overboard and run away. The idea is that the strings of barrels will float until our troops on the island can tow them ashore. It is a strenuous and unsatisfying routine. But I want to hear about your battle and learn from your experience. Tell me all about it. That was the first intelligent request I had heard in a week. I explained with enthusiasm and in detail our latest operation, noting our failings and the enemies, and giving my fellow professional an overall analysis. In conclusion, I said, whatever our mission, we must always be ready for battle. I think it is wrong ever to consider fighting as merely secondary. Caution is necessary to be sure, but excessive caution is crippling. Please tell Admiral Tanaka not to repeat our mistakes. He left the ship to catch a plane back to Rabaul. His quick visit to Truk and his remarks about the curious supply activities of Destroyer Squadron too indicated that the enemy undoubtedly had air supremacy at Guadalcanal. Japanese destroyers were even having trouble acting as fast freighters. Supplies of every kind were acutely lacking for Japanese troops on the island. Their daily distress calls emphasised shortages of food and medication. Admiral Tanaka had been given responsibility for the stave-off starvation missions Toyama had described. In these operations, each destroyer would carry hundred or more drums of supplies in each nighttime delivery. Delivery consisted of jettisoning the strings of drums within 200 or 300 metres of the Guadalcanal coast. There, army troops were supposed to boat, swim or wade out to retrieve the precious containers and haul them ashore, where they would be manipulated into the jungle and hidden from enemy air attack. Tanaka's eight destroyers left Rabaul November 27 and headed southward to the Shortlands. The passage had to be made furtively. In the darkness of the 29th, the squadron departed the Shortlands at 22.45 for the final leg of the mission. Taking every possible advantage, the force fainted eastward toward Roncador Reef and Ramos Island. Then, early in the morning of November 30, the eight destroyers in single column turned sharply south and headed straight for Guadalcanal. An enemy patrol plane made contact with the squadron at eight, and Admiral Tanaka realised that his secrecy of movement was broken. Soon afterward, an observation post on Guadalcanal reported a dozen enemy destroyers off Lunga Point. Messages from other posts soon confirmed this movement of an enemy surface force around the island. At 15, Tanaka issued a directive to his squadron, it is probable that we will encounter an enemy force tonight. Although our primary mission is to land supplies, everyone is to be ready for combat. If an engagement occurs, take the initiative and destroy the enemy. The squadron reached the rendezvous point off Tassafaronga at 21, and speed was slowed to 12 knots. A northeasterly breeze yielded a visibility of 9,000 metres. Tanaka's ships approached in single column formation with Takanami as scout, 3,000 metres in the lead and slightly on the port bow of flagship Naganami. This was a flexible deployment for destroyers and far more advantageous than the overcautious double ring formation used by Admiral Abe on the night of November 12 to 13. The American force which came to challenge Tanaka under Rear Admiral Carlton H. Wright repeated the formation used by Callahan and Scott. They too were in single column, four destroyers in the van, five cruisers, then two rear destroyers, the whole led by destroyer Fletcher with its modern radar equipment. Two weeks earlier, Fletcher had survived the Callahan-Scott debacle from its position at the tail of the formation. 
When the action opened, the US side had a distinct advantage of numbers. Besides numerical inferiority, Tanaka was further handicapped in that the decks of his ships were stacked high with drums of supplies. Because of these cargoes, the ammunition supply in each ship had to be reduced by one half. In addition to the reduction of shells for their guns, each of Tanaka's destroyers carried only eight torpedoes instead of their full quota of 16. Admiral Wright's squadron had left Espiritu Santo early in the morning, specifically to intercept Tanaka's destroyers, which had been spotted by scout plane. At 21-6 flagship Minneapolis's radar first detected the Japanese force at 26,000 yards. Ten minutes later, radar screens in Fletcher caught a target 7,000 yards on the port bow, and the destroyer prepared to launch torpedoes. But five precious minutes were wasted before Fletcher, as well as destroyers Perkins and Drayton, were given permission to fire torpedoes. A total of 20 fish sped toward Japanese targets. None hit. Meanwhile, Admiral Tanaka was busy studying charts and the position of his ships. His cargo dumping point was only 5,000 metres distant at 2115 when scout ship Takanami reported. Enemy ships bearing 100 degrees, identified as three destroyers. Takanami immediately launched eight torpedoes at these targets and opened fire with her guns. This was done on Takanami's own initiative, without waiting for permission to open fire. Until the five US cruisers opened fire at this time, Tanaka had been unaware of their presence. Instantly, Tanaka ordered, Belay supply schedule. All ships, prepare to fight. One minute later, at 2122, Tanaka further ordered, All ships, full battle speed. American gunners seemed to have aimed at only Takanami. She, at any rate, was the only Japanese ship hit. Many direct hits set her furiously afire, and she sank with all of her 211 crewmen. With flaming Takanami as a shield, Tanaka made a daring 180-degree turn to bring his ships on a course parallel to the enemy column. He then speeded up to close with the enemy ships, and Naganami swung to port after firing a spread of eight torpedoes at leading cruiser Minneapolis. The six other Japanese destroyers promptly followed Naganami's example. These broadside launchings had far more precision than those of Fletcher and her companions who fired at targets approaching head-on. It was no wonder or surprise that the American torpedoes missed. They had been fired at an almost impossible angle, apparently without proper calculation of the many factors involved. The consequent poor marksmanship reflected a lack of training in torpedo technique. Two of Naganami's torpedoes, on the other hand, hit Minneapolis, shattering her bow, exploding a fire room, and slowing the lead cruiser almost to a stop. New Orleans, next in line, narrowly avoided colliding with the flagship when a torpedo, apparently from Makinami, caught her port bow and exploded two forward magazines. The blast knocked off the cruiser's bow clear back to the number two turret. Cruiser Pensacola, next in line, also fared badly. While trying desperately to avoid a collision, she took a torpedo hit which ignited fuel tanks, turning her into a floating torch. It was 12 hours before the flames were conquered, and the crew knew that they could save her. Light cruiser Honolulu followed Pensacola until that ship turned to port when the torpedoes began hitting. At that time, Honolulu swerved to starboard to avert colliding, and thus got out of the glare shed by her burning colleagues. She zigzagged away to the northwest, and escaped being hit even by gunfire. Northampton, the last cruiser of the enemy formation, could have seen little of the activity until she was upon her three flaming colleagues. She started to follow Honolulu, but seeing the Japanese ships dashing to the west, turned westward herself and opened fire with eight-inch guns. Hers was a hasty, blind shelling which scored no hits, but two Japanese torpedoes caught her port side causing a monstrous explosion which swept her with flames and left Northampton to sink. Tanaka's squadron swung northwest at full speed as soon as its torpedoes were launched, leaving behind a badly battered and confused enemy. Honolulu, the only undamaged cruiser of the American force, mistook rearguard destroyers Lamson and Lardner for Japanese targets and blazed away at them until they turned and fled. The action had lasted about 15 minutes. Flagship Naganami slowed down some 50 miles away from Guadalcanal, and Admiral Tanaka took account of his forces. Not one of his surviving seven destroyers had been hit by a single shell or torpedo, 
nor had they lost a man of their crews. It was a remarkable performance to have inflicted so much damage on the enemy at a cost of only one destroyer. But Admiral Tanaka was not jubilant. He grieved over the loss of Takanami and was glumly silent during the withdrawal while he considered returning to the battle zone to rescue survivors and re-engage the enemy. A tally showed that four of his seven ships had spent all their torpedoes, one had fired only half of its supply, and the two others had fired none because of a bad angle during their firing ran. A total of 44 torpedoes had thus been expended. In light of this, Tanaka decided that his force was no longer in shape to engage the enemy. Accordingly, at 23.30, he gave the order to return to Rabaul. The high command took a dim view of this decision, even though Tanaka claimed to have sunk a battleship and two cruisers, and to have damaged four other cruisers. The facts were impressive enough, for Tanaka had sunk one and seriously damaged three heavy cruisers, at a cost of only one destroyer. But these statistics were not as persuasive with Tanaka's superiors as the fact that he had failed to unload the cargo so badly needed on Guadalcanal. The Navy's displeasure with Tanaka was, reflected in his transfer to Singapore shortly after this battle, and then to Burma. These transfers, which took him away from the active fighting front, where his ability was so desperately needed, undoubtedly saved his life. Who knows what the Navy's short-sighted retributive policy may have cost in subsequent losses which Tanaka might have prevented. Throughout the war, Tanaka never again held a responsible command afloat. Fifteen years after the Battle of Tassafaronga, I visited him at his farm near Yamaguchi. In discussing the action, he told me, I have heard that US naval experts praised my command in that action. I am not deserving of such honours. It was the superb proficiency and devotion of the men who served me that produced the tactical victory for us. In this, I am not rejecting glory in order to escape criticism. I accept the principal criticism levelled by fellow officers. It was an error on my part not to deliver the supplies according to schedule. I should have returned to do so. The delivery mission was abandoned simply because we did not have accurate information about the strength of the enemy force. I believed that the enemy formation had four van destroyers and four more following the cruisers, as in the Callaghan-Scott formation of two weeks earlier. I saw no percentage in having our seven destroyers, low on ammunition and decks loaded with cargo drums, fight another running battle against eight US destroyers. Had I but known that only one cruiser and four destroyers remained in fighting trim, tears came to his eyes when he spoke of destroyer Takanami. We were able to defeat Admiral Wright's ships in this action only because of Takanami. She absorbed all the punishment of the enemy in the opening moments of battle, and she shielded the rest of us. Yet we left the scene without doing anything for her or her valiant crew. However Admiral Tanaka may have felt about the Japanese effort at Tassafaronga, it is fair to consider what the US naval historian, Rear Admiral Samuel Elliot Morrison, had to say about this battle. It is always some consolation to reflect that the enemy who defeats you is really good, and Rear Admiral Tanaka was better than that. He was superb. Without his trusted flagship Jinsu, his decks cluttered with supplies, he sank a heavy cruiser and put three others out of action for nearly a year, at the cost of one destroyer. In many actions of the war, mistakes on the American side were cancelled by those of the enemy, but despite the brief confusion of his destroyers, Tanaka made no mistakes at Tassafaronga. Before Admiral Tanaka's transfer to Singapore, there was time for him to lead several more transport missions to Guadalcanal. On December 3rd, he commanded a force of four cruisers and eleven destroyers which succeeded in delivering 1,500 drums of supplies to the shores of Guadalcanal. Tanaka was ready for a repetition of the Tassafaronga action, but the Americans apparently were not. Tanaka's phenomenal win had staggered the US Navy. There was no surface opposition, but some planes harassed the force and dropped a few bombs which slightly damaged one destroyer. It was a sour note in the operations that only 500 of the drums were picked up by the island forces. Four nights later, Tanaka was back again, this time with just 11 destroyers. Excessive repetition of a single formula in warfare is almost bound to fail, and this time planes from Henderson Field damaged two of his destroyers. On this night too, Tanaka was confronted for the first time by a new kind of opponent, motor torpedo boats. Eight of these swift little PTs so harried his force 
that the reinforcement effort was called off and the destroyers returned to base. Tanaka tried again on the night of December 11, using nine destroyers, and succeeded in dropping 1,200 drums of supplies. Air attacks on this convoy were ineffective, but the PTs struck again and hit flagship Terazuki with two torpedoes which set her aflame. Her crew tried valiantly to save her, but all efforts proved futile when the fires exploded her depth charge stowage. Tanaka was injured when the torpedoes hit Teruzuki, but he transferred his flag and got home. In addition to the loss of his flagship, Tanaka was grieved by news that of the 1,200 drums transported and dropped on this run, only 220 reached Japanese hands. Admiral Tanaka was hospitalized at Rabaul, and there he dictated a memorandum to the High Command recommending the withdrawal of forces from Guadalcanal. In reply, he received orders assigning him to Singapore, this flat rejection of Tanaka's recommendation was unfortunate since it was becoming apparent that the island was no longer tenable. Submarines as well as destroyers were being used to bring in supplies, yet their combined best efforts brought only a trickle of what was needed to support the 20,000 troops. Through these exciting days, I remained at Truk. I felt sorry for Tanaka, but could do nothing to help him. There was no new destroyer available for me, so I could only watch as the skilled hands from repair ship Akashi worked over the scores of holes which cruiser Helena's armor-piercing shells had put in my destroyer. Amatsukaze was patched enough that I was able to leave Truk on December 15 for the homeland where precision repairs could be made. The five-day voyage was uneventful. As we passed the island of Saipan, I saw a dozen Japanese planes and was curious about how they would react to our appearance. I was disappointed when not one of them even bothered to determine our identity. This nonchalance, if such it was, bespoke a laxity which was unwarranted and unforgivable while Japanese were being bled white in the Solomons. I was almost able to forget the war, however, when we entered our home port of Cure. Seagulls crisscrossed our bows in graceful greeting as we enjoyed the quiet of this peaceful and familiar harbour. It was so different from the savage waters of the Solomons. Could it be that such contrasting places belong to the same world? When Amatsukaze was safely docked and arrangements were made for her thorough inspection and repair, I was able to take a week of home leave. I arrived at my home in Kamakura on December 27. The week passed all too quickly, but it was a delight for me to be able to spend even that much time with my family. Kamakura is one of the most beautiful cities of Japan, and I enjoyed revisiting its scenic places with my children, and hiking through the city and its surrounding hills. Pine trees hummed their eternal song to the balmy Pacific breezes. It was almost too good to be true. I felt especially lucky to be at home for the New Year holiday. Despite the pleasure of being home, there really was no forgetting the war. One day we had planned a picnic, but my wife was unable to go with us. She had to attend a meeting of neighbourhood wives to discuss household brass and iron collections for the use of the military. The children and I had our picnic and a long walk in the pine-clad hills. On our return from the picnic, I was vexed to find that my wife was not yet home. My daughter explained, Do not be angry. Mother has to attend many long meetings these days. Remember, Daddy, this is wartime. Later that same evening, I had a Tokyo phone call from my old friend Commander Ko Nagasawa, who was working in the personnel bureau. He said, This is an unofficial call, so don't get flustered. A group of our classmates are getting together tomorrow night for a Bonankai. We have chosen Yokohama's Isogoen as the meeting place. It is a good restaurant, just about halfway between Tokyo and Yokosuka. It is near your home, so we are counting on your being there. I arrived the next evening at the appointed hour of seven, to be greeted by Nagasawa and Commander Enpei Kanuka, who was naval liaison assistant to Premier General Hideki Tojo. I was surprised to see that Kanuka had been able to get this far away from his busy and important office, to attend an unofficial party. Seated next to him in our reserved room, I said, You must have had a hell of a time in your job recently with all the troubles we've been having down south. No, Hara, not at all, he replied glumly. As a matter of fact, for the past five months, General Tojo has asked me for no advice, no briefing, no business, nothing at all. The General seems to have no interest whatsoever in naval operations. My only duty in this time has been to attend nightly cocktail parties for VIPs. I don't like to drink, I'm bored to death, and the routine is killing me. 
With your capacity for alcohol, Hara, maybe you should replace me. Ordinarily soft-spoken Kanuka had raised his voice quite noticeably during this harangue, and grim-faced Nagasawa of the Personnel Bureau had listened in silence. Otherwise, everything was quiet and sedate, unlike the riotous parties of our younger days. About twenty of us were gathered that evening, commanders and lieutenant commanders, and the talk was concerned almost entirely with the war. When asked to describe the situation in the Solomons, I was happy to oblige. I don't know how you who are stationed here view things from the homeland, but it is hell at the front. As professionals, you all know better than to base your judgments on the official bravado announced by headquarters in Tokyo. We have had some tactical victories, but we are suffering a strategic defeat. Our destroyers and submarines in the Solomons are now being used as transports, and ineffective ones at that. The entire party was listening as I described actions I had seen. There was interest in my candid account, but someone reminded us that this was a party and we should stop talking shop. A few jokes and wisecracks were exchanged, and someone told about an affair with a geisha girl in Sasebo, but there was no real mood for merriment. We all knew our dismal prospects for the future. I truly wanted to let them know what we had experienced in the South, what my own reactions were, and my opinions. I knew that a party was no proper place for such topics, and yet, there was no other chance, and it was disappointing to see the world weariness of my classmates. There was much drinking but little sign of drunkenness when the party broke up at a fairly early hour. Farewells, outside in the cold, starlit night, were spiritless mutterings. See you again. This was said without conviction. Very few of that group survived the war. Tojo might ignore his naval liaison officer, but there was no ignoring the formal representations of the naval high command. The ranking officers of the army and navy were huddling daily in secret strategy conferences at Tokyo. The last of a series of these conferences took place on December 31st in the Imperial Palace, attended by Emperor Hirohito. The conference decided unanimously for the withdrawal of troops from Guadalcanal. The rest of the holiday with my family passed happily but too quickly, and I returned to Kure on January 7th. Three days later I got orders relieving me from command of Amatsukaze and assigning me to duty at the Yokosuka Naval Station. This was only a few miles from my home. Within a week of my departure I was again settled comfortably at home, and then I fell ill. The doctor said it was exhaustion resulting from extended rigorous duty at sea. I was confined to bed for two weeks. Adding to my misery, further orders came on the 25th, naming me commander of Destroyer Division 19 with instructions to take its four modern ships to sea two days later. I phoned Nagasawa to report my inability to accept the post. Understanding and comforting as only a good friend can be, he assured me that there would be other such posts available when I recovered. My convalescence seemed terribly long. I had never felt fatigue in battle. At sea, a few hours' sleep would always refresh me. Now, suddenly, I was aware of how exhausting my sea duty had been, and realised why Admiral Nagumo had looked so worn in November when I saw him at Truk. As my strength returned, I took long walks. The hills and the beaches were beautiful. In the woods I gathered pine cones each day and carried them home for fuel. They burned well enough to be used or cooking, and that helped. But it was depressing to realise how scarce all basic commodities were. By the end of February I was fully recovered and called Nagasawa to ask about my next assignment. His vague reply made me uneasy that the Navy had forgotten about me. I called daily, without an encouraging word until early March, when Nagasawa informed me that I was to command Destroyer Division 27. What? I shrieked belligerently. Why the 27th? Just a minute now, Hara. Calm down and listen for a minute. I know the 27th has a bad reputation, but this assignment is all the more a credit to you. The admirals feel that only a man of your ability and experience can whip this division into shape as a fighting unit. My first reaction was the product of shock. I was not really upset. After all, when a man is assigned to command four ships for the first time, it is an honour no matter what kind of ships they may be. Then too, I had missed the earlier attractive assignment through default. I had nothing to complain about. The 27th was composed of four old 1,700-ton destroyers, whose best speed was 30 knots. Their crews, strictly second class, were the object of derision to men of other ships. It really was a greater challenge for me. 
With this in mind, I replied to Nagasawa, Don't misunderstand me. I welcome the assignment and will do my utmost to make it the best outfit in the second fleet. I am happy to have this command. When and where do I report? I'm glad to hear you talk like that, Hara. Three of your ships are at Truk. Flagship Shigur, Autumn Rain, is waiting for you at Sasebo. When can you leave? As soon as transportation is available. Good. You'll have a reservation on tomorrow's express train leaving Tokyo Central Station at 13.30. I arrived in Sasebo on March 9th and went immediately to my flagship for a tour of inspection. My first look at the crew convinced me that I was in for a real job. I thought back to the tribulations of my experience in training the crew of Amatsukaze in time for the midway operation, and realised that compared to my present crew, those men had been crack experts from the outset. Shigur's crew looked like an ill-disciplined bunch of landlubbers, but I looked on their clumsiness and ineptness with mixed feelings, confident that I could work them into competent fighting sailors. At least I was not discouraged so my feeling was worlds apart from what it had been six months earlier in Amatsukaze. As to my flagship, having served in much newer destroyers, I found Shigur quite decrepit. She was old, sadly in need of maintenance, and worst of all, she could do no better than 33 knots. The newest destroyers could make at least 38 knots, and my old battle-tested Amatsukaze, now back in service, was capable of 34 knots. But I pushed aside these vagrant thoughts, and my hopes were high that Shigur might prove worthy in battle despite her apparent shortcomings on this first day of our acquaintance. But even with my high hopes, I never dreamed that her exploits would earn for her the nickname of Indestructible, and fame as the most publicised destroyer of the Pacific War. Escorting two transports, Shigura left Sasebo to join the other three ships of my command. We arrived at Truk after a quiet voyage. Entering the spacious atoll, I had the feeling that nothing had changed in my absence. Akashi, the old repair ship, still moored where it had been four months earlier when Amatsukaze limped in from the Solomons, was busy as ever. I was wrong, however, in thinking that nothing had changed. Truk was as before, but the war situation to the south had undergone drastic changes in the brief period of four months, as I shortly learned. I reported to Vice Admiral Nobutak Kondo in Atago, flagship of the Second Fleet, as soon as we had anchored. Entering his cabin, I was shocked at the haggard appearance of this man who had always been noted in naval circles for his excellent grooming. His appearance shocked me as much as Admiral Nagumo's had five months earlier. He motioned me to a chair. His voice was hoarse and low, and he spoke slowly as if with great effort. Hara, you have all my sympathy in your new assignment. It is a tough one. I can only say, take care of yourself. Use every possible caution. I had certainly not expected such a greeting from my commanding admiral. Kondo's statement was so startling that I was at a loss for a response. He continued, almost painfully. Although you are a division commander, we are so short of ships that three of yours are being used by other commanders. It may be months before you have your full division under your command. He paused and mused briefly while I sat in uncomfortable silence. Then he continued, Above all, Hara, do not be impatient. I intend to keep you here for at least three months so that you can get acquainted with and train your subordinates and also familiarise yourself with the rapidly changing war situation. Kondo was a remarkable man, and he was wonderful to me. Thus, it was with great reluctance that I had to criticise his combat ability earlier in this writing, on this particular day, however, I was dazed and stunned in leaving his cabin. At his suggestion, I studied his flagship records of the war during the past five months. The most outstanding occurrence was the withdrawal from Guadalcanal. At Kamakura, while recuperating from my illness, I had heard radio announcements of a spectacular and perfect victory. Imperial headquarters, loath to use the word withdrawal, had coined and applied to this operation the word tension, turned advance, without providing any details. As a result of the palace decision at the New Year's Eve meeting, Imperial Headquarters issued an order on January 4, 1943, for the withdrawal of all troops from Guadalcanal to begin the later part of the month. Plans were worked out accordingly and secretly, while making every attempt to convince the enemy that we were about to make an all-out determined stand. 
American intelligence, which had been so successful in detecting Japanese plans for the midway battle, failed utterly to anticipate the withdrawal plans for Guadalcanal. It is still one of the miracles of the war to me that this should have remained such a successful secret. The marvel of this increases when one considers that the enemy enjoyed absolute supremacy of the air in the vicinity of Guadalcanal at this time. Starting in mid-January, Japanese air activities in the area were sharply increased. On the 30th, a task force of two carriers, two battleships, and more than a dozen other warships steamed out of Truk and headed for Guadalcanal in a decoy movement to attract the attention of the US Navy. Meanwhile, during the evening of the 28th, 300 fresh troops were landed on Russell Island, just to the west of Guadalcanal. Needless to say, the Guadalcanal garrison was heartened by news of the planned withdrawal. They fought with surprising determination and strengthened their dogged resistance against enemy reinforcements. Considering their deprivations and pitiful shortages, they fought valiantly right up until the end. On the nights of February 1st, 4 and 7, a total of 22 destroyers ran into the very shores of the island to effect the evacuation of 12,198 army and 832 navy men. The destroyer crews were appalled at the sight of these troops, most of whom were living skeletons. They had not eaten for days and were so weak and emaciated that they could not even express joy at their rescue. The withdrawal was a phenomenal success in which Japan's only losses were destroyer Makigumo sunk and three others damaged. That marked the conclusion of a six-month operation which left 16,800 Japanese bodies strewn in the tropical jungle, and scores of warships sunk with their thousands of sailors around this bitterly contested island. The many pages of reports on the subject all boiled down to one fact. Japan had lost the Battle of Guadalcanal. I turned next in my reading to operations in New Guinea and found them almost equally depressing. The army had tried to march a division from Buna on the east coast of Papua across the Owen Stanley Mountains to reach Port Moresby. Most of the troops perished in the mountains. While the navy was having its troubles on and around Guadalcanal, the army's expeditionary force was starving to death in Papua. Meanwhile, the enemy was making steady advances in the Papuan jungles of New Guinea, reducing Gona on December 9, 1942, Buna on the 14th, and Madang and Wewak four days later. More shocking to me than the amounts of these land losses, however, was the Battle of the Bismarck Sea. Japan's defeat there was almost unbelievable. Japan's two main airfields in eastern New Guinea, at Lai and Salamaua, were turned over to the army on November 15. The army decided to reinforce these positions with a division of troops from Rabaul. These troops were loaded in eight transports which departed Rabaul on February 28, escorted by eight destroyers. The force commander, Rear Admiral Masatomi Kimura, had counted on sufficient air cover for his ships, but in broad daylight on March 2nd, and again the next day, more than 100 enemy planes attacked the convoy unopposed, sinking all eight of the transports and four of the destroyers. The second day of the action, there were 26 planes of the Imperial Navy flying high cover for the convoy, but they were unable to break up the attack by low-flying bombers. More than 3,500 soldiers perished in this operation. Never was there such a debacle. It was the complete opposite of the successful withdrawal operation from Guadalcanal, now I could understand why Admiral Kondo had been in such a funk when he greeted me in his cabin. I paced the small cabin trying to figure how such a thing had come to pass. Rear Admiral Kan Takama entered in search of a document and I asked if he could explain the terrible defeat of the Bismarck Sea. He said, I can't criticize without knowing all the facts, Hara, but after reading these official reports I don't understand it. The operation was carried out with all due care and caution but the air cover was completely inadequate. At Guadalcanal our planning was right, the withdrawal was carried out in full secrecy, and the enemy was outfoxed. It may be that this spectacular success caused the army leaders to think that they could risk a precarious operation without full preparation and support. One thing is certain, the army did not provide proper air cover for the Bismarck Sea Convoy. Admiral Takama left the cabin, droop-shouldered with his document, and I returned to reading the record of further shocking events. On March 5th, destroyers Minaguma and Murasame were sunk in Kula Gulf before they had even fired a shot. The enemy's success was the result of his radar-controlled gunfire. 
I was totally depressed upon leaving flagship Atago and ordered the launch to take me ashore. As I stepped on shore at Truk, I realised how much things had changed. My shipboard impression of the atoll had been deceptive. Faces in the street bespoke the changes that had taken place in five months. In the officers' club, I was greeted by Captain Tomiji Koyanagi, Admiral Kurita's chief of staff, and we had a pleasant reunion. The disastrous Bismarck Sea battle being uppermost in my mind, I lost no time in asking for his views on it. Admiral Kimura himself has told me of the new method used by the enemy bombers in attacking his convoy, Koyanagi said. The big planes came skimming the waves, dropping their bombs to skip on the surface and hit into the side of the ships. Conventional evasive manoeuvres proved utterly useless against these skip-bombing tactics. Kimura thought the enemy was using aerial torpedoes and futilely manoeuvred his ships accordingly. High-altitude bombing against ships at sea was ineffective, so the enemy developed this new tactic which foiled our every evasive effort. We now have the serious problem of how to oppose skip bombing. Have you any ideas? The day had been so full of shocking surprises for me that I was drained of ideas. I felt like a freshman on his first day in college and returned to Shigur with a splitting headache. After arranging shore leave for the crew, I retired to my cabin and spent the next 24 hours in search of answers to the many new problems of the war. I finally gave up, realising that these questions were lofty and esoteric compared to my own immediate problem of readying an untrained warship crew for battle. I had to begin with fundamentals. After the crew's day of rest ashore, we started intensive training in the waters around Truk. I was grateful to Admiral Kondo as I found how shrewd his appraisal had been. It soon appeared that three months would be the very minimum needed for organising this inept crew. In my training plan, the first month was devoted to shipboard fundamentals and controlling my temper. If a drill fell short of my standard, I personally demonstrated and directed its rehearsal, dozens of times if necessary. I drummed it into the men that, in a life-and-death struggle, nothing short of perfection is adequate. At first they were bewildered by such high standards, but gradually they became willing and eager to carry out my orders. They were not as bad as I had originally feared. Yet throughout all this training I was haunted by the realities of the war situation, as revealed in the combat records I had seen in cruiser Atago. At the end of a month I began to feel that some problems were capable of solution. For one thing, a study of the past year's actions showed that many of them were patterned on the same formula. When a tactic succeeded, it was likely to be used repeatedly and without change by the Imperial Navy, and this often proved disastrous. Admiral Kurita's October incendiary bombardment of Guadalcanal from battleships Congo and Haruna was a great success. One month later, Admiral Abe, with battleships He and Kirishima, was ordered to undertake the same kind of attack. Not only did the Imperial Navy fail to hit the island with a single shell, but a battleship was lost in the process. The disaster of the Bismarck Sea in February cost Admiral Kimura 12 of his 16 ships in his unsuccessful attempt to bring reinforcements to Ley and Salamaua. He was merely trying to do what the Navy had done six months earlier, and successfully when it reinforced Buna. But those six months had seen a build-up of enemy air strength in this area, and that had not been properly taken into consideration. Admiral Tanaka carried out a series of brilliant transport operations to Guadalcanal in November and December 1942. When other destroyer groups, led by officers of lesser ability, tried the same kind of operation it frequently led to such debacles as the March 5th massacre in Kula Gulf. Such inflexibility was stupid. It appeared that the Imperial Navy felt the enemy was gullible enough always to play our game. The situation reminded me of the passage from the memoirs of Musashi Miyamoto, the superb medieval swordsman. In fighting, it is bad to repeat a formula, and to repeat it a third time is worse. When an effort fails, it may be followed with a second attempt. If that fails, a drastically changed formula must be adopted. If this fails, one must resort to another completely different formula. When the opponent thinks high, hit low. When he thinks low, hit high. That is the secret of swordsmanship. I was impressed with the applicability of this advice to our present situation, and determined to convey my ideas to Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. I could not simply walk into the office of the Commander-in-Chief of Combined Fleet and set forth these opinions to him directly, 
So, on April 24, 1943, I went to flagship Musashi to explain my views to his chief of staff, Vice Admiral Matome Ugaki. At the ramp of the huge battleship, there was only one warrant officer to meet me. This was extraordinary, and not in keeping with Navy protocol for greeting a flotilla commander. My announced desire to see Admiral Ugaki was met with such a blank stare that the man seemed doltish. After a long pause, he asked me to follow him, and we began walking through the maze of passageways and ladders of the giant ship. No officers were in evidence along our route, and the men I saw looked bewildered and depressed. When we reached the cabin marked Commander-in-Chief, my guide opened the door and silently gestured for me to enter. The smell of burning incense wafted out from the softly lit cabin. The centre of the chamber was filled with a large draped table on which were aligned seven coffins. I turned questioningly to the warrant officer. He lowered his head and answered quietly, Last Sunday, Admiral Yamamoto and his staff flew south from Rabaul in two bombers. As they neared Buin, the bombers were ambushed and shot down by P-38s, apparently from Guadalcanal. These are the remains of our commander-in-chief and six of his staff officers. Admiral Ugaki and the others were critically injured. It seemed beyond belief, and yet there was no doubting what I could see and what I had just heard. My eyes filled with bitter tears as I offered a prayer for the repose of the dead.